Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. In local crime, police are looking for an intruder who broke into my residence, stole every one of my pristine unread collector's edition books, which I love dearly, and replaced them with tattered, torn copies. If you did this, and you're listening, I will find you, you monster. You are listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Khan. Hey, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hey, Council Readers. What? <laughs> I, I was waiting for it yeah, to get you're, spooky. You're not going to do it? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, sorry to say that uh, Ben Graham's spooky corner has gone out of business. Oh, oh no. Yeah, so, no bit. No, no bit this I'm, this week. That's why you're wearing that closed sign. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, it's hard <laughs> to fit the sandwich board in the studio. Yeah, it but... is. <laughs> and today we are obviously covering the ending of Needful Things. If you are reading along, and if not, major spoilers ahead, and Josh is leading our discussion. Yeah, I am. Let's just roll right into it, because the closest I can get to a summary is Castle Rock is falling apart. Yeah. I yep. would say it's on fire, but it isn't yet, because <laughs> we're going to get to that. Uh, but we opened this section up with uh, Polly thinking she's going to get cujo this being my first King book, I didn't pick up on any of the Cujo talk. Yeah. This first time through. And you guys you guys have both read Cujo, right? I have not, actually. Oh. She is there to do her, her deed. She is going to dig up a canister and burn the stamps and animal porn that are inside. Oh. <laughs> and uh, put, in a, put in a letter and walk away like nothing's going to happen. Except for... She sees eyes in the barn. Is that just her imagination? Uh, you could go either way, man. <laughs> I haven't read Cujo, so I don't know if it's more of a supernatural thing or just a straight up rabies. I, I'm pre- from my knowledge of Cujo, it's just rabies, but okay. I'm excited to read it. It would be great <laughs> to find out that everyone's just public knowledge of the book Cujo is wrong. <laughs> secretly a demon or something. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, let's jump back to our buddy Buster, who has officially lost it. Uh, ben, do you want to tell us about Buster coming home finally? This scene is hard to read, but also fascinating. I like Some of my favorite parts of King books is characters once they have passed the line from (laughs) bad person into literal complete madness. Buster comes home and he screams for his wife Myrtle, who is upstairs with her doll, and it is bad. (laughs) It's, It's gruesome. It is gruesome. And just how he browbeats this poor woman in two ways. Yeah. But he he forces her to get him a hammer and a screwdriver to break off the handle of the car and just has her by the hair throughout pretty much this whole scene yeah. before basically beating her so bad her face is gone. Mm-hmm. That it all, and it's because she slips up and calls him Buster. Yeah. Like that's of of all things he has decided that that is the last straw for murder. I feel I, like he would have killed her no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say, I think that was just the excuse. I was really hoping, I was really pulling for her. I thought that she was going to attack him. That would have been great. That would have been, been nice. awesome. And just to see her put up a fight. Yeah. Yeah, but no, just the way that she just like resignedly is like, well, he's crazy now. And oh, we didn't even talk about the crazy part that he's been driving around Castle Rock trying to avoid the satellites that are watching yeah. him. <laughs> because they have put satellites in low orbit that are tracking him and oof 
Yeah, but Buster's <laughs> nuts. I thought you were going to say that we passed over Myrtle doing her deed and then seeing the other person come out of the Knights yeah. of Columbus and they just stop and look at each other for a minute. It was a meet cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just two people doing their pranks and then moving on from their lives. <laughs> that is important, though, that yes. we get this weird scene of Myrtle putting this weird box in a cubby hole in the Catholic choir room, I it's, think. Uh, the Daughters of Isabella Hall. Yes. Before we even get into the rest of the book, I feel like we have not really brought up, uh, we, we've mentioned it in passing, the through line of the Catholics versus the Baptists in the town. Yeah, we've, we've touched on it a little bit, and I believe it was in the last section, there's a much deeper thing that we didn't go into about Steamboat Willie and Father Brigham mm. really resenting each other almost immediately when they both were in town. And so this has been something that the members of each church have constantly held a resentment, mm -hmm. if not outright hatred for one another. And with all of these things coming up, it's just getting worse. It, yeah, and it becomes such a big part <laughs> of the end game. Yeah, it does. I really love how he does that, how it's it's been throughout since page one, basically. Mm -hmm. But the way it ramps up very quickly at the end is really cool. <laughs> God, the, the ending of this book is just so perfect. Now we go back to Ace, who has dug up several of the X's on his map. He is coming here because this has got to be the big one. Turns out it's the same place that Polly was just there. He digs up the canister and inside is a letter and that it's very notably it's typed, not handwritten. It's from Alan to Ace basically saying you got here too late. Here's your cut of the treasure and <laughs> leaves him behind one dollar. I, there's a single sentence that, uh, after Ace, there, there's actually two drops on this same plot of mm. land, and the first one is, he convinces himself it's fake, and that the last one is real, and he's 100% convinced, and there's this one line when he digs it up that he says he's foaming at the mouth, and <laughs> his spittle is dripping like it's full of infection and disease. Like a dog. Well, he, <laughs> he is Cujo. Cujo. Yeah, it's a really neat, just a neat little throw in. Yeah, I didn't, I, I totally missed that. So it is quarter to six. Early twilight has settled over Castle Rock. And news crews have come in because of the beating of someone to death in the police department. And the giant car accident out front. So news crews are piling in. Multiple homicides. Multiple homicides. And everybody from from away is setting up their cameras and getting all this footage, trying to go live. And everyone from here is circling around back to needful things to buy a gun. Yeah, his front shop is closed. Or is, does he close yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, this is where he closes it. And he's out in the alley. And people are just going back there. Oh, my, we'll get to it, I suppose. But my favorite person to go back there is Cora. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she goes back there in a way Just that, get into it, man. So everybody's coming to either pay their respects or because they feel a need. Or they're like, oh, man, I got to really get this person who played this prank, did this deed to me. And... They're upset. And he's like, well, I have a solution. Like we talked last episode, have a gun, have a gun for you, have a gun. Everybody has a gun. It's like Oprah, but with guns. <laughs> and that's a uh, pitch for the running man. <laughs> oh my Oprah God. in yep. parentheses with guns. <laughs> Cora is at home and this is after, how do I even? It's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because she's, she's being interrogated, not interrogated. She's being interviewed by the police because her son has just blown his head off in the garage. That's where we ended the last episode. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't seem to understand that. No. Or care. Or yeah. care. Well, and we think she doesn't care because she's, you know, sitting there and she seems distraught because she's distracted because she keeps touching the glasses. We come to find out later that she doesn't even know why they were there. So that was somehow almost worse. 
Yeah. That she I, that's didn't right. even know her son was she dead. She specifically says, arrest him or whatever. Yeah, to <laughs> like, herself. Like she's he's like, in trouble. fine, just arrest him. So anyway, she gets rid of them so that she can go back up and... I hate to say this, and I'm sorry, but fuck Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. <laughs> so why'd that get you? I don't know. It's, you're, Your reluctance, you're, I think. Yeah, I think that was it. Just... I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting you to say, but just your disdain. That, that was what for I had the a idea problem with. Fucking Elvis. <laughs> Barf. I hate it so much. Anyway, and her, so she, she comes into the parlor. She's making her way through his home where she's going to bone him. And she gets up to the room and guess who is there with Elvis? Who? It's Myra. What? <laughs> the other person fucking Elvis all the time? <laughs> yeah. And I don't even want to talk about how explicit that scene is because it nasty. But <laughs> <laughs> Myra is like, you know, get out of here, bitch, and breaks her glasses. Through the dream, which is yeah. very... Creepy. Very creepy and weird. So anyway, she's oh, upset God. because... Myra broke her glasses, so that's why she's going to needful things, because she's got to do something about this. But she gets dressed, and... In quotes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and she's walking, and it's it's later, Buster's kind of around, and he observes her approaching needful things. And she has, like, her dress misbuttoned and not all the way buttoned, but the place that it's not all the way buttoned is just her pube area. <laughs> her, her, her stomach and her pubes. See... I, the way I imagined it is she, for some reason, buttoned the top button and the bottom button. And <laughs> everything is just hanging out. Which is a look. Yeah. And I, I do love her response, so I wish I could remember exactly what she said. But someone points it out to her that, oh, ma'am, you might have missed a button. And she's like, the fuck do I care about that? <laughs> she's ready for blood. Uh Something that I, I think is really interesting, uh, when Gaunt is giving out all these weapons, he reminisces about his past uh, being a peddler in Central Europe, and he points out that that during the plague in Europe, he sold from a wagon led by a horse with a black tongue, and in the end, he always sold them weapons, and they always bought them. Yeah. I loved that part. Yeah. I, a good... I, I just love getting into a villain's brain. <laughs> it's so cool getting the history and the idea of just how ancient whatever Leland Gaunt is. Is. Yeah. Very cool. Meanwhile, uh, Alan is out of Castle Rock. He is... For, he spends a lot of this chapter and a little of the next really just trying to get a chance to talk to Sean Rusk because he is in the hospital because they had to sedate him after what he saw. And he feels like Sean is the key to all of this. Meanwhile, the police are actually doing a pretty good job handling things. Uh, Henry Payton, who uh, we talked about earlier, who was there during the uh, Neddy Cobb, Wilma Jerzyk mm -hmm. battle mm -hmm. royale. He has come in and he's taking control. And they are getting all this information. The most important that no gun expert can identify Hugh Priest's gun that they found at the site. Yeah, that's cool. Because <laughs> it's not from this world. Whatever world Castle Rock is in. Whatever yeah. level of the tower. Things like this are cool details, but they always make me think, what happens after the book? You mean with those guns just in the world? Yeah. Yeah. What happens? People, it's just going to be an unexplained mystery forever. I think the shop just sweeps it under the rug, keeps it quiet. That's kind of what it studies them. No. Yeah, the shop. Yeah, the shop keeps shop. Yep, because that is a good guess. I wouldn't have <laughs> thought of that. Well, and the great thing here is we get a call from the doctor because we found out that Henry Beaufort survived his gunshot wound. They got to him in time, but he died on the way to the hospital. Not from the bullet wound, but from some toxic substance that was introduced into his system when he was shot. It made his brain bleed and his heart explode. Gaunt's guns got poison bullets. Yeah, that that was it's... rough because I was so excited for him to find out he was surviving this gunshot. Yeah. And then he died in excruciating death. <laughs> it's 
so unnecessary. It is such overkill. <laughs> it's almost hilarious. To, to borrow a phrase from Stephen King, it would be hilarious if a man's heart hadn't it just exploded. <laughs> I, I think that it's just another level of how despicable Gaunt is. Like, yeah. there are no half measures. Yeah, no no risks. Everything he gives these people, or any people, is poison one way or another. So we jump back to Buster uh, post-murder, who they point out that for a good 20 minutes, at any point the police could have come by and picked him up, but they had so much else going on. Buster just leisurely cleaned up. <laughs> Uh, cleaned up the the murder scene a little, took a shower, changed his clothes, and he goes into his office to find that winning ticket. Looks busted as hell. It looks like what it actually is. And now I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks this way because he doesn't need it anymore. That's kind of what I thought. He, It seems like when people lose their faith in the object or they've completed Mm -hmm. a task or they have come into some sort of knowledge that they see what's really there. So I think they can see what's really there for a couple of reasons. Well, it's also he's planning on killing himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it, I think you're right, CM. It's when they've given up, mm-hmm. the object loses its power over them. Because there's another character who is in a similar situation later, who also at the same time sees their item for what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else is going to push you over the edge. <sighs> Seeing what you gave up everything for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But unlike the character we'll talk about later, this character is already batshit insane. So there's no (laughs) pulling him back at all until he gets a call from Leland Gaunt, who finds a really great way to get him to not kill himself by just saying, I thought you were better than that. I thought you were going to help me take them down. But all right, I guess if you don't want to help me take them out. Well, he's reminding him that he does still have something to live for, I guess. Uh, It's a really uplifting (laughs) moment for uh, people with severe suicidal (laughs) depression. Sure, I bet. Yeah. Uh, If you're going to live at least, or if you're going to kill yourself, at least live long enough to kill your enemies. (laughs) It's tale as old as time. (laughs) Well, he takes the bait. And Gaunt... Oh, hold on. Yeah. I should say I, that's, I don't actually believe that. <laughs> yeah. it, good, it, good it took addendum. me a second to realize just how dark that thing I just said. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill people, guys. Yeah. <laughs> or yourselves. So he takes the bait, and Gaunt already has a news van waiting down the street with a vial of acid inside it to eat off the, the chain of his handcuffs, a wig and glasses... <laughs> Why? Nobody cares. Right, nobody, like, yeah, yeah, they're kind of looking for Buster, but they have so much else going on. Yeah, especially since, like, earlier you said the cops are doing a great job. I disagree. (laughs) Um, Because, uh, what's his name, Henry Payton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Has taken over and basically exiled the constabulary of castle rock all the, the people, people that, who know the people of the town so who could be really helpful in this exactly situation. and they've just said fuck off go go away and now they're running around with their heads cut off and uh yeah don't care about buster what you can't argue at all you can't argue that from the outside coming in that anybody in castle rock looks like they have their shit enough together to help <laughs> true because all this shit's gone yeah. down on their watch I, sorry, I was going to comment, you know, we know that Gaunt has kind of like these weird sexual things and maybe some kinks. So maybe he just wanted to see Buster in a wig. Like the idea of <laughs> Buster in a wig is how he gets off. <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me. <laughs> what? How do we know he has kinks? What is this? Uh, Mr. Gaunt likey. <laughs> Because you called it a fetish yeah. last episode. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. I don't and he has remember amnesia. these episodes after we're done recording. Yeah, he has amnesia when he gets a blowjob. So we know that he has, you know, different sexual needs and desires. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, now, we take another aside and we find out 
what happens to Eddie Warburton and Sonny Jacket all over a car, a car repair bill. Sam, do you what? want to tell us about Eddie and Sonny? Yeah, this is great because it didn't go down the way I thought it was going down. I, I have a question before yeah. you start. Literally, didn't we get their, like, beef in the prologue? Yes. Like, this hasn't been mentioned since no. the first five pages of the <laughs> book. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, because I thought I missed something when they came in, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I remember this. But worth it, because it's a cool-ass <laughs> scene. Eddie's the janitor at the municipal building, and he's the one who's calling Gaunt to kind of give him a heads up, like Alan might be coming over and doing other spy things. And Sonny is a mechanic. And of course, yeah, we heard about that beef that they had uh, from our old man, Stephen King. <laughs> character, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the very beginning. And so Eddie got his gun from Gaunt, and he just knows that Sonny messed up his car and it's time for revenge and Sonny is also prepared because he knows that Eddie's coming to steal his tools his uh socket wrenches socket I guess. sure yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> car shit <laughs> and so he he walks into the shop and you know sees Eddie sitting there with his feet up on the desk reading a newspaper just relaxing and does he say something funny no, I think I think Eddie just shoots him. Yeah, I the think newspaper. it's un- I feel like we should give him a funny one-liner here. Hold these presses because he's reading a newspaper. Yeah, no, there we go. Yeah. Oh. So, behold my gauntling gun. What? What? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he just shoots him. Just pow, pow, pow. Right through there. the paper, which is a real Godfather like, <laughs> moment. <laughs> But my favorite part is that then when he looks, like, you know, drops his paper, he realizes he didn't shoot Eddie. He just shot some other guy who works there. And he's like, oh, shit. Oh, that's not Eddie. And then he hears a voice behind him that's like, I'm Eddie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly uh, how it goes. uh, I'm Sonny, because Sonny's the other guy. (laughs) whatever. No, no, I like that. So he shoves in behind. I'm Eddie now. (laughs) I'm Eddie. And he turns around and he's like, what? (laughs) Bam! (laughs) Also, did you recognize who he shot on accident? I probably did, but I don't remember. Ricky Bisonette, the guy who got the uh, underage photos from God. Oh, guy did not realize that. He got his comeuppance, guys. Good. Fuck that guy. I wish he would have died slower now. (laughs) Jesus. Anyway, so Sonny is now Eddie. Eddie is Sonny. (laughs) They're all Sonny. They're all dead. It doesn't matter. Yeah, so he shoots him. And and then he's standing over him and he's going to finish the job. And he's like having this moment of clarity, kind of like we talked about, maybe also as you're dying, the the power of those objects are suddenly gone. And he's trying to, to tell him like, hey, wait, I think we've both been tricked. Like, that note I got from you must not have been from you. And I'm not here to do anything. And the guy doesn't even let him finish his thought. But as soon as he shoots him, he's like, you know, I wonder what he was going to say. <laughs> Maybe it was important. I'm going to go hold my sockets. And that's how the police find him holding his sockets. And he is not ashamed and not concerned. He's just like, he was going to take my treasure. Yeah. It kind of sucks that Sonny just gets arrested. Like we don't find out if he, dies because he's like a massive piece of shit well if they took him to the municipal building (laughs) that's a good point (laughs) yeah because he was like a huge racist and shit yeah i I did not like him no he sucked fuck that guy but henry payton sees him holding these rusty nasty tools yeah and leads him away and then as soon as he handles the situation another set of gunshots goes off because Lenore Potter shot Stephanie Bonsaint in the flower bed she hadn't torn up. But wait, twist! It wasn't. It was Melissa Clutterbuck, because that was her deed. I, I don't remember any of these women, honestly. I was just like, <laughs> I don't even know if we talked about the Bonsaint and, uh, and what's Lenore her Potter. name? Yeah, because they talked we, about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah how she, it, how weird it was that I, this was written in the early '90s when things like meditating were enough to consider a character as the weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was reading energy, and and her own energy was all messed up. Yeah, who has crystals in their house? <sighs> <laughs> 
Finally, we go back to Alan, who has finally, thanks to a nurse... Mm, I Okay, I loved this, though. Yeah. Sam, do you want to explain how this goes down? Yeah, Alan's... This whole time in this section that we've been figuring out what's going on with the townspeople and they're getting all their guns, Alan is in the hospital and he's not in the room with Sean. He's just waiting. Sean has gone into shock. And this nurse, this very stern nurse, whose priority is to protect her patient, doesn't have time for Alan. She just wants Sean to be able to get some rest. And he slowly sort of gets her to come around just by being himself, just by, you know, being someone who he explains to her like, hey, this this little boy might have the answer to why, you know, not only did his brother die, but a bunch of other people also died today. Something is going on and I might be able to help other people if I can talk to him. And so she's sort of, you know, kind of grumpy about it and you don't know if she's going to come around. And then much later she comes into his where he's waiting and she's like, well, I'm going to go on my break now. And uh, the other lady probably be a few minutes. So no one's going to be over there if you decided to walk down that hall and go into that patient's room. And if you do and someone sees you, just remember that I told you not to. (laughs) <laughs> and he gives her a hug and kisses her cheek and it's it's just cool it, i thought it is. i didn't know how that would go i no. was really glad that is happening mm-hmm. so he makes it in and sean wakes up and alan does his his alan thing he does his magic trick the appearing flower which he mentions is like this is i don't know if this is gonna work because it's on its last legs but it does work and it starts to set sean at ease And he gets Sean comfortable enough that he tells him about how uh, his mom hasn't noticed anything because she's too busy visiting the king. (laughs) I love that he's like, who's the king? And he's like, Elvis, you idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He tells him about the baseball cards and he tells him about needful things. And it makes Alan realize all of the times throughout this book that he is meant to get to needful things just before something happened. And it all kind of clicks into place for him that that is the source. That is where he needs to go to handle this. And he thinks about Polly again, too, because he's remembering that she also had a dealing with Gaunt. And I I like that he's again faced with that choice. Do I stay on being sheriff or do I take care of my personal business? And he decides, got to be sheriff for my town. We go back to Ace, who has sped back to town, ready to kill Alan for what he did. He briefly crossed paths with Craig T. Nelson, who (laughs) is looking for Frank Jewett and says, he killed my parakeet and shit on my mother and then leaves. And Ace is like, wow, that guy's got some stuff going on. (laughs) That I I forgot how that storyline, the the Craig (laughs) T. Nelson storyline went out. And it was so much different. For some reason in my head, I thought because the last time we saw them, he was heading to Needful Things. And Frank Jewett was right behind him. I, for some reason, thought there would be a scene of them both showing up at Needful Things at the same time. <laughs> that would have been amazing. But uh, I, honestly, how it turns out is pretty good, too. I forgot how satisfying their end is. <laughs> so Ace goes to Gaunt and uh, helps him pack things inside because Gaunt's done with his dealing And then the most badass scene happens. Ben, do you want to tell us what happens when Ace gets inside Gaunt's back room? Gets inside Gaunt's bad attitude. Bad graces. (laughs) Sorry, that... Good one. (laughs) Fucking got him. I'm the one-liners today. (laughs) Uh, I I don't remember this. Oh, Oh, it's... I can... Ace cops an attitude because he's Ace and he forgets that he's the low man on the totem pole in this exchange. And Gaunt reminds him in a very creative way by attacking him with his like crazy long, like he sees him. I want to say how he probably truly looks or more probably closer to how he truly looks. He's he's monstrous. Has a demonic face. He sees the smoke pouring out of his whole face. Like, (laughs) <laughs> this happened once before where we Gaunt's alone and they describe smoke pouring out of his ears and nose and mouth. And there's a certain amount of smoke that can come out of your face and be threatening. 
But uh, uh, at a certain point, your whole head is just going to look like a <laughs> chimney top. <laughs> You know, I never thought about where that line was. The logistics of the... Yeah, he's like bat in the air. Like, hold on. I kiss you. So he he throws Ace across the room. Like, like one-handed just lifts yeah. him up, tosses yeah. his ass. Oh, God, and so he, he rips his shirt. Like, his shirt is tattered. And he's re- telling him, like, I will eat you. Like, yeah. How about remember, I, he, he I'm the boss. He basically is like... Uh, what does he say? How about I uh, rip your guts out? Basically, like, you're the same as that rat I ate earlier. Mm-hmm. That was a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, bringing Ace to tears, he is sobbing uncontrollably, begging for mercy. And I just love that Kant says, you're disgusting, Ace. I like that in a person. <laughs> <laughs> Ringing now endorsement. that's a one line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang it. And I just wanted to side note, this is when Ace remembers the kids from the body and how the, quote, snot noses had won. And after that moment, when everything started to turn bad for Ace. Way to hit your peak when you're in high school. (laughs) (laughs) So Gaunt teams up the dynamic duo of Ace and Buster to enact the final stage of his plan. This is truly a meet cute. It's the buddy cop film we all wanted. Yes. They there could be a very different book that is just about Buster and Ace being insane and yeah. like traveling across the country blowing shit up. Yeah. I would read the hell they're out the, of that. They're the Hobbs and Shaw of the, <laughs> of the Castle Rock cinematic universe. Hobbs, why is that your go-to buddy? See, I, they're oh. really the Calvin and Hobbs. <laughs> <laughs> High explosives. What are you talking about? Because of all the explosions. That's Fast and Furious is 90% they, yeah, explosions. That is fair. <laughs> They're the Prometheus and Bob of... <laughs> <laughs> so we, Never mind. we cut it's across... like t- three people. <laughs> <laughs> we cut across town to the Daughters of Isabella and the Knights of Columbus uh, meetup. I, okay, I'm sorry. I thought these were going to be bombs. All these oh, boxes? Oh, 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 oh. No. This remember, was gross. Remember that note several chapters ago? We're going to stink you up so bad. I, you're going to wish you never been stunk up I so that bad. Was I like an expression. We <laughs> forgot about that and how hilarious that was <laughs> yeah. in the moment because that's nothing. Uh, it turns out it's something. Turns out it's everything. It was very literal. So the uh, the Catholics have met up at the same time across town. Reverend Rose has called a meeting to discuss their plans. And this, this is when they talk more about the feud, how it's been going on for so long. There are about 70 people crammed into the Baptist church when Don Hemphill bursts through the door, red-faced, tears, snot rolling everywhere. He smells worse than anything you could imagine. He smells so bad, children cry. <laughs> also, I want to point out, there are children in here for oh, what's about to happen. I oh, missed I didn't that. Even put that, that. Also, he's covered in blood, but it's just because he's a butcher. <laughs> he's a butcher. But I just, that's just a neat addition to the visual. <laughs> that's how my dad once greeted a boy I brought home. Covered, covered in, blood? in blood? Yeah, he was deer hunting. And he very... <laughs> my, my dad's like this old redneck slash hippie somehow. He's both. Huh. And he's like, oh, I see what's happening. And he didn't put his gun down, didn't take off his bloody overalls, <laughs> just came in to greet my friend. That's amazing. <laughs> Dads are the best. <laughs> so Don Hemphill says they <laughs> stunk up his shop with their stink bombs, destroying all the product in his building. And they left flyers for the casino night in there. So he knows it's the Catholics. <laughs> just about this time... The doors slam shut, and they hear laughing outside, and a box somewhere in the church goes off, and smoke starts pouring in. They start stampeding over each other, trying to get out. All the exits are blocked. Jump across town, and in the Daughters of Isabella and Knights of Columbus, two more similar boxes also go off, and they hear their doors slam shut, and they fill with smoke. (laughs) And it's just a back and forth of everyone puking, throwing each other around. They throw Reverend Willie through a window to get him out. (laughs) Through the chaos, something very tragic happens. In all the smoke, nobody can see. 
and in the Daughters of Isabella, they're climbing over each other, and Antonia Bisset has her neck broken and no one notices. And she never even went into needful things. She never did a deed on anybody. Mm. It was sad. Yeah. It is sad. But also, how is that the only person that died in this? Like, this <laughs> yeah. is a real stinky carry he's pulling on everyone. <laughs> what a stinky, stinky carry. carry. And <laughs> I mean, it's in real life when people try to stampede out of tight places, like, People it's like if die. there was a fire. Yeah. yeah. I thought I was expecting more death, if yeah. anything. Well, you're in luck. <laughs> Everybody in all camps, they escape, they rally together, and the Baptists and Catholics start marching on one another. A trooper nearby calls in that the Baptists are on a march. He calls it into Henry Payton, who dismisses him until he says they're on their way to, quote, kick some Pope sucker butt. And I just love there's this long silence, and Henry says, Ah, oh, Jesus tiddlywinks <laughs> Christ. <laughs> and now it's time, everyone. Welcome to Blesselmania! Blesselmania? <laughs> <No. laughs> Blesselmania! These two. <laughs> These two... How ch- long have you been waiting to yell that? <laughs> weeks! I've been waiting for weeks! <laughs> the, these two church groups like sprint towards each other the second they come in eye contact. And they they make their rush. Cut over real quick to, to Cora and Myra Rusk. Cora breaks into uh, Myra's house, pulls a gun on her, sees that Myra's in bed fucking a picture frame (laughs) i did try and imagine that (laughs) what is she doing exactly that seems splintery yeah i'm also for i don't know what the size of the picture but i'm imagining it is a framed full poster size picture i was picturing like at least like the size of inches like the size of a body pillow (laughs) 12 inches yeah they call him the king for a reason (laughs) hey Well, the point is, Myra has a gun under her pillow uh, pillow also, and they just shoot each other, and it's great. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. Yeah, I'm glad these two women are dead. I don't ever want to hear anything about fucking Elvis Presley ever again. (laughs) Well, you're in luck, because we are back to the Sacramental (laughs) Showdown! (laughs) Nan shoves her fingers up Betsy's nose (laughs) to the second knuckle, which is great. I don't think that's uh, physically possible. No, I don't think so. I think you tickle her yeah, brain. you're in your sinuses yeah. at that point. Uh, Reverend Whoa. Rose and Father Brigham finally come head to head in a battle I'm calling Preach Fighter 2. Brigham that's, puts... That's a stretch, man. <laughs> Brigham, Preach does not rhyme with street. <laughs> Brigham puts Reverend Rose in his finishing move, the Eucharist lock, and starts bashing his head into the street. The lone trooper who was trying to stop this gets shot in the dick for his efforts. Oh. <laughs> and while clutching, and I quote, clutching the ruins of his sexual equipment, Oof. finally sees backup come to relieve him, and he thinks all's going to be well. Spoiler alert, not going to be. Also, like, think about that guy. He gets shot in the dick. Terrible, but survivable. Except now his heart's going to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> Which is he can worse. only hope. <laughs> <laughs> now it is time to head to needful things. Alan is on his way, and at that moment, lightning strikes and the power goes out. Now, from this point on, there are key moments like this: the power, the lightning strike, the power going out, and some other things that really time stamp the events of everyone else. It's we really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it is really masterfully written. The there's a tree that falls near the tin bridge that happens multiple times, mm-hmm. and it makes you realize how fast all of this yeah. is happening. Yeah. Uh, we get a glimpse of Norris Ridgwick alone in his shed. He is going to hang himself because he can't deal with the guilt of knowing that he his deed set this last piece in motion. And before he can jump off the stool he's on, he sees the dirty, rusty bamboo pole that he traded his soul for. He feels the the these hands kind of shove him before he can step off, and he claws himself free of his noose just before it's too late. And I did not think he was going to get out. 
Yeah, I thought, I thought that he was, was going to die. Mm-hmm. Which is so cool. It's, you don't expect Norris Ridgwick, of all people, yeah. Yeah. to have this really heroic moment of like, I've done bad things, but this is my chance to do to do it right, mm-hmm. to make it right. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to head to the municipal building, get back up, and then I'm taking down Gaunt. Meanwhile, we jump across town to Polly, who has now kind of, re- Gaunt has been in her head, but now her Aunt Evie is in her head. And uh, and we had uh, Melissa, a listener of ours, send us a message to point out that Aunt Evie is in the body. Yeah, did not remember that yeah. at all. That was super cool. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out there because that was a real great catch. Aunt Evie tells her the Asuka will not cure her pain, but it redirects that pain to her heart and soul. Ugh. And that was brutal. That was so, so cool. Do you want to tell us what happens with Polly here? Aunt Evie kind of helps her come out from under Gaunt's pull because she's trying to get her to recognize something that she knows subconsciously but missed. And that is that the letter that she received did not have the name she goes by on it. Yeah, the letter was addressed to Patricia Chalmers. But when she was living in San Diego, everyone knew her as Polly. Always. Mm -hmm. She was always Polly. And any mail sent to her would have the name they used in their paperwork. Yeah. Yeah, she never used her real name. So if Alan had called asking about her, nothing would have come up. So she finally puts this all together and it seems like it just the way the scene is written it it doesn't drag but you feel her spending excruciating time you know trying to reconcile this information with what Gaunt's been telling her and so she finally realizes like oh what is this thing actually this thing that I've had close to my skin Mm. for according to this book probably like four hours (laughs) (laughs) yeah like a day and a half (laughs) at most and she decides enough she's gonna rip it off and it's cool we get that you know gaunt's like screaming in her head trying to stop her and and she starts to feel the pain Mm -hmm. come back in her hands and she's like doesn't matter it's gonna be awful it's gonna suck and i just have to do it she rips it off throws it across the room it hits the wall falls busts open and i didn't know this was going to be in there i wouldn't have guessed this (laughs) and it reminds me kind of of the scene in it Mm -hmm. But a spider comes crawling out and she just instinctively knows she's got to kill that spider. So she's following it. It's running into her bathroom. But as she's following it, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And her hands are hurting and she grabs a plunger and she's trying to hit it with a plunger, which is not a good instrument. It's the size of a cat. It eventually, yeah. And she's hitting it with a plunger. And the, you know, the power goes out. Uh, the this way is happening. that the way Ugh. it's written is as she's like following it and batting at it, and it's dripping uh, liquid from its t- its uh, giant uh, pointy bits. And, <laughs> yeah, fangs is the word for those um, <laughs> that are like leaving divots in the linoleum, mm-hmm. and it's so intense. And then the the part ends with it rearing up in the bathtub as that lightning strike from earlier God. happens and the lights go out. This also reminds me kind of of that amazing scene we got in Rose Matter with uh, Norman yeah, and Rosie. Yeah, in the and stairs. The, yeah, in the dark. Ugh. And when he... When she rips his yeah. jaw? <laughs> because the, the spider lunges at Polly and she's just got to grab it, grab its its little legs. Yeah. It's sticky things that make it walk, as Ben would say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, lay off Ben. His spooky store closed. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's why he forgets where's, words like fangs. Where's my gun? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she just, just brutalizes this thing. Yeah, she, it's so satisfying. She bites through one of its <gasps> legs and, like, Iker gets in her mouth. And it's on her uh, arms, and it's like she has a burn yeah. on her arms, like she was scalded. Ugh. And then it's when she badass. finally kills it, later on, she looks back at it, and it's the size of a normal spider. That yeah. messed me up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? What was she... Th- okay, sorry. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, and this is when she realizes, you know, I didn't directly do anything to Alan with my deed, but... Yeah, right. And she goes to find him. Yeah. yeah. And she, Aunt Evie speaks up that he's not going to be at the municipal building. He'll be at Needful Things. Is this the power of the white? 
Absolutely. Yeah, because she she has this in her head where she's like, this isn't, she even says, this isn't actually Aunt Evie, this is just my subconscious talking to me in her voice. Mm -hmm. But is it? And Aunt Evie's like, it doesn't fucking matter, just listen to me. (laughs) But don't go to the place you should expect to find him, go somewhere else. (laughs) Meanwhile, Alan pulls up to Needful Things and on instinct grabs his snake can trick. And I noticed he pulls up and is like, I wonder if Gaunt's still here. And he pulls up next to the Tucker Talisman that he can't see because he he's yeah. a cop. <laughs> That's, yeah, that was so cool. I totally missed that the first time, but I got very <laughs> excited. The scene, also real brutal. Yeah. He breaks the glass, enters Needful Things, and it smells like it's been empty for months. There's a layer of dust over everything, but there's a TV and a VCR and a videotape on Gaunt's counter. The letter says, attention, Sheriff Alan Pangborn. And it's it's got taunting him. He says, he, the letter says he has an item for Alan, but he must pay the price for it. It's the truth of what happened in the last moments of his wife and son's life. There's nothing else Alan would give up everything for, yeah. clearly. Meanwhile, we cut over. It is 730 and the tin bridge explodes. We, we didn't explain why it explodes. Oh, oh yeah. At yeah, all. we haven't gone into <laughs> Ace and Buster and their wacky hijinks. Uh, their wacky coked up hijinks. <laughs> Ace making Buster take cocaine for the first time. Hilarious. Amazing. It was kind of cute. <laughs> I don't know why. It's they're just so <laughs> their their friendship is so sincere it's it, it really is, is yeah <laughs> they're just a couple of pals um, those goofy guys just setting bombs all over town yeah they break in and they get the Chekhov's dynamite and <laughs> go about the town just gleefully placing them places and they put them in the tin bridge and they're going down main street and just breaking windows and throwing them in and was that a 40 minute timer on, on tin bridge because that's the first one they so. said yes. so yeah, yeah they're progressively uh, yeah as uh, like it even says as like they see alan coming right after they place the the dynamite under the tin bridge yeah. so as he drives across it there's a <laughs> stick of dynamite ticking down But yeah, it's all over the town, and the Tin Bridge fucking blows up. Back at the Bible Battle Royale, Nan hits Father Brigham with her Stations of the Cross body finisher, (laughs) taking him out. And they all come to a stop when the bridge explodes. And there's this pause, and the cops are like, fuck, okay, we've got everybody's attention. But before Henry Payton can take control, Nan just yells, the Catholics are using dynamite! (laughs) And then the brawl (laughs) intensifies. We go back to Norris, who shows up and finds that uh, there are only two cops left in here. There's a Seton Thomas and... Who's in the middle of having a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. he's having a heart attack the rest of this book from this <laughs> moment on. He finds out about everything that happened. He's on his way to leave, and he sees Ace and Buster on their way out of the courthouse, which is next door. He this draw- is so badass. <laughs> so hard-ass. Yeah. Norris levels his revolver on them. Calls, yells, halt, and stops them from pulling their guns. At this moment, down on Main Street, the barber shop explodes, distracting Norris. Ace draws and fires into Norris's shoulder, clipping his lung and Ugh. shattering his collarbone. Keaton shoots the other cop, uh, Price, who is out there with him, shoots the, the other cop in the head. Norris struggles to lift his gun one last time, shooting Buster in the stomach. Ace... Being the good partner that he is, <laughs> walks over to Buster and shoots him in the head three times. It's really romantic. Because they've set a bomb in the courthouse, and he's like, this is going to go any minute, so fuck this. <laughs> I didn't even think of it as a, like, fuck this. He does it really, like, he seems honestly not remorseful, but like, well, shit. I yeah. like this yeah, guy. he's putting him out of his misery. He really is. It's a weirdly... It's like Ace has a code for a second. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. But Ace knows they set the timer in the courthouse for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So he has to get the fuck out of there. And they have put, like, a metric fuck ton of dynamite in the courthouse. They put the rest of it, pretty much. (laughs) And he takes off, uh, Ace 
takes off running towards needful things. They they fire after him, but they don't get him. Norris asks Seton, who, like you said, has having a heart attack, to get in the cruiser and drive him to needful things, because he knows that's where Ace is going. Mm-hmm. Now, let's wrap up the story of Frank Jewett and Craig T. Nelson, shall we? Uh, Ben, do you want to take this one? I don't know how I feel about this scene. It is so strange. (laughs) Their whole plot line could be completely removed from the book and have no consequences. No, this moment is so cool because of the Thunderstrike. It's another big moment. Mm -hmm. It's another timestamp moment. They mention, and then you forget about until later in someone else's story, you hear the thing. Yeah. Frank Dewitt is on the steps of the courthouse, right? Yep. So wait, when does this... Because that's where the shootout with Ace and... and yeah, that has just happened around the corner. That's right, because yeah. he hears, he hears it a gunshot nearby, and he's like, huh. <laughs> so, uh, huh, seems weird. But he is he's standing on the steps of the courthouse with Craig T. Nelson's gun that he stole from his house. Which I didn't understand because he heard Craig T. Nelson on the phone being like, I'm going to needful things. Didn't quite get that. <laughs> uh, but he's standing there and Craig T. Nelson just... I, I'm sorry. We have to acknowledge that this character's name is not Craig T. Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> just once. Yeah, it's George T. Nelson. Um, but Craig T. Nelson just happens to be... <laughs> George T. Nelson as portrayed by Craig T. Nelson. Yes, thank you. Because uh, he's the coach. Um, <laughs> it just happens to be walking by, and they look up at each other, and they're like, hey, it's fucking on, dipshit. And they agree to, from the top and bottom of the stairs, to walk towards each other until the next lightning strike. Yeah. And then they oh. draw down. Oh, God. It is... If these weren't the two worst characters in the book, it would be a real gunslinger moment. Yes! <laughs> but as they're walking, finally, as they're like, they're like right on top of each other, the lightning strikes, they both pull, and their bullets ricochet off of each other, and neither of them are shot. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this split second when I was reading where I was like, what are we supposed to take away from this? <laughs> Why do these two characters get a miracle to right. save them? That's not worth it. And then the courthouse vaporizes them. <laughs> well, and right before it does that, they're both like, yeah, yeah. you know what? <laughs> maybe, maybe we should just call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> they have that moment with, like, in a movie, they look into each other's eyes and do a smo- slow <laughs> smile and nod. Like, yeah. That was, you got me. Let's walk into the sunset (laughs) together. And then they are literally turned to atoms. It's great. So fucking great. We jump back to Needful Things with Alan. Alan, he hears the voice of Brian Rusk telling him he shouldn't watch this. And Alan knows he shouldn't watch this, but there's no way anything is going to stop him. He breaks down and he puts in the tape and it is a video of the road from the day his wife and son died. One quick thing. Uh, He has, Gaunt has left a TV and a VCR and they're not hooked up. Alan thinks to himself, it doesn't matter that there's no power in the town. They'll still work. Yep. But then he still bothers to take the time to hook them up. <laughs> He's pragmatic. <laughs> He's a pragmatic man. I guess. Well, what he sees is a very clearly fake video of Ace running them off the road. But it still gets Alan. I, I want to know if you caught the caught the tell. Yes, yeah, CM. CM. Oh, the seatbelt thing? Yes. No, because I was so irritated that he was buying it, mm-hmm. which I think is what that was intended to do. Mm-hmm. So that later when you ha- when he realizes it, you're realizing it with him. So yeah, I was yeah. totally caught up in the moment. I also, I missed it the first time, but the second time when it happened, I yeah. was like, oh yeah. Like I said on Instagram, I rushed through this because <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> so <laughs> as he finishes this, He hears Gaunt's voice saying, get him. He lives in Mechanic Falls and Alan is going to kill Ace Merrill. At this time, the barbershop and funeral home explode and he barely notices. Yeah, he stops noticing everything at this point. They're literally across the street Mm -hmm. 
and he just dead eyed does not care. Just pretty badass. Yeah. Okay. At that point, Castle Rock means nothing to him. Yeah. Nothing matters except for making Ace pay for what mm-hmm. he did. And he gets in his car just as Polly sees him from across the street. And she's calling for him. He doesn't respond. She runs over. She grabs onto his car and he backs up, dragging her down the road, <laughs> which is pretty badass. Yeah. When you also remember that Polly's hands are now back to where they were. And she manages to hold onto that car door. Polly gets through to Alan that it's not true. Whatever Gaunt said, it can't be true. And Alan, at this point, just realizes something's wrong. We already kind of said it, that in the video, he sees his wife wearing her seatbelt. We know from very early on, the reason she went through the windshield is because she Mm -hmm. wasn't wearing her seatbelt. And so that's that's the mistake. But Alan realizes it, but he doesn't say it yet. And as they are having this moment of like, whew, okay, we're calm, we're safe. Ace Merrill shows up out of nowhere, (laughs) takes Polly hostage and puts a gun to her head. Overhead, the thunder cracks. Frank and George explode uh, back at the courthouse. (laughs) But this sends debris flying all over Castle Rock. The bricks are going through the walls of other buildings Bricks are raining down all over the town. Norris and Seton are driving. Some of the bricks go through the back windshield even (laughs) and almost take them out. It is raining hell on Castle Rock. They mentioned at this point that it was 40 sticks of dynamite that was placed inside the courthouse. And 19 men and women were killed in the blast instantly. This giant explosion finally brings an end to the Pentecostal pandemonium. (laughs) Father Brigham... (laughs) Helps Reverend Rose to his feet. I know you have more. (laughs) How many backups did you write? Uh, Catholic cage match. (laughs) Just get them all out. Uh, (laughs) Oh, no. I I, I edited out the ones and I took them off my list, but I did have like seven more. I'll post them them on Facebook. Uh, Reverend Rose uh, and Father Brigham stop and hold each other for the end of the world because they're both. (laughs) Well, yeah, they think it's the apocalypse. They think that they've brought on the apocalypse. We cut over to Andy Clutterbuck, who is weeping, holding his dead wife in front of Lenora Ponder's house. And they say it's the last sober day of his life. Mm. Two years before, he will take a drunken icy plunge into Castle Rock and die. Across town, after hearing about what happened to Lester, Sally is in her closet where she hanged herself, holding a soft, rotten piece of wood. And the wood lice are crawling off of her body. Gross. Also question. Yes. Yes. And let's not spend too much time on this, but (laughs) Sally has this, this piece of wood is her needful thing. And I believe we're led to believe that it's her needful thing because she is so religious. And this is a religious relic. In the town, as we're seeing, people uh, are looking at other people's needful things and seeing them for what they really are. They're just garbage. Brian is not super religious or was not. He just liked baseball. So how did he have the same experience as Polly had if the piece of wood was not his needful thing? Because that that doesn't happen with everything. Because that piece of wood was for Polly. Or not for Um, Polly. For Sally. For Sally. Like that he had had the same thing as he had. Yeah, but why didn't he see it as... Yeah, but in the first chapter, when he's the first person in, he picks up that thing. Maybe it's just because they all have their power while they're still in needful things. Probably. Oh, maybe you see whatever they're supposed to look yeah. like while they're in the shop. Yeah. Because when Norris is uh, di- slicing up Hugh's stuff, he yeah. sees his rotted uh, foxtail. Foxtail, yeah. yeah. No, I, I assume it's just okay. he was in needful things. Thank you. Yeah, I knew there was a reason, but I was like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay. Poor Sally. Go on. Yeah. Uh, Norris and Seton are approaching, and they see the standoff with, with Ace and Alan and Polly. Norris grabs his gun, crawls out so that he's sitting on the window, mind you, shattered collarbone, Mm -hmm. and he braces himself on the top of the car. While the guy having a heart attack is driving. It's so cool. Not not even just shattered collarbone, but the poison. He can feel the Mm -hmm. poison working up to his heart. He is locked in, waiting for Ace or Polly to move. He's so focused, he does not see the door to needful things open. Leland Gaunt steps out in front of his precious awning and he's just standing there. He's going to stand there and watch the finale because no one's noticed him except 
now that Alan's sanity is coming back to him from the corner of his eye, he sees Gaunt come out. He sees that Gaunt is wearing a traveling coat with a hyena hide valise with that is puffing and bulging, and it sounds like faint screams are coming from it, and <laughs> Alan does not hear that with his ears. This is when he voices that Annie wasn't wearing a seatbelt on that day in the video she was. He's still holding the can of nuts snake trick, and he yells, It was still buckled, and you fucked up, Mr. Gaunt! And he spins on Leland and grabs the can and opens it towards Gaunt. And CM, what happens? Okay, first, this is cool because he has that moment again where Ace has Polly. He's gonna shoot her, possibly. And he looks kind of, not over his shoulder, but he sees Norris coming. He also sees Gaunt and he's like, I have to let Norris take care of Polly. I have to go after Gaunt. And he makes that decision and he fires it off. And what comes out of it is, fuck, what comes out of it? A, a real fucking snake. snake. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Gaunt doesn't like snakes, apparently, the way he likes rats. <laughs> <laughs> I can't decide how I feel. Well, I know how I feel about this ending. It fucking rules. But I have yeah, been well known to not like mm-hmm. Deus Ex Machina. This is right on the edge of that because, like, he when he grabbed he like searches for the snake in a jar and he's just like i don't know why i'm doing this but I- and he he's like there's no re- there's no logical reason behind it and normally that would bother me but for some reason this book it just it works because alan just is going on instinct i guess i don't know there- it, it works for me there is a logical reason for it, though. Alan doesn't recognize it, but I think we as a reader do on some level, because this whole time we've been getting to know him, magic has been his thing. Mm-hmm. We've seen him use it on kids who are in trouble, and he's referenced that this usually works, and he does all this stuff, and that's kind of how he connects you know, with children when he has to talk to them. He does it in the hospital for Sean, and mm-hmm. even though it shouldn't work and the the flower thing is like on its last leg is still enough to cheer him up. So I think he's relying on these totems as, I I don't know, I think for him it's always done something positive. The the way I think of it, and I wanted so bad to think of Mr. Gaunt as an it, Mm -hmm. as a Dandelo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think he is after the end of this, but this is the same way that the kids defeat it. Yeah. At the end of it, it's, fucking magic isn't yeah. it interesting that with all of the religious stuff going on this faith is the faith that comes through yeah like, that is pure oh, shit. yeah that's pretty amazing <laughs> a super gunslinger moment too also i'm sorry yeah. he moves like a gunslinger and Fuck yeah that's when i fell oh, in love yeah. with alan pangborn <laughs> especially oh yeah because he fires off this snake and it f- bites gone a bunch of times in the fucking neck mm-hmm. and as he screams, he reaches down for his case of souls, and it's gone. Because in the split second, <laughs> Alan nabbed it. So, gunslinger. Yeah, and he's just sitting there with it between his legs, and he's like, come get it, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> At this moment, Gaunt starts showing his true self to them because he's demanding that case back. Ace loses his attention for just a moment. Polly sinks her teeth up to the gums into his arm, and he throws her aside. Polly's a biter. Polly's a biter. Norris fires, taking Ace out with a shot to the back of the head. And Alan and Gaunt only notice each other. All of that stuff happens outside of them. Gaunt says the items inside that valise are his fair and square, and if Alan gives them back, he'll leave Castle Rock. But Alan refuses, causing Gaunt to step forward with his glowing red eyes. And on instinct, he starts making shadow puppets of a sparrow in the headlights. Oh, that's so cool. He says, says, the sparrows are flying again, Mr. Gaunt. A reference Mr. Gaunt does not get. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, (laughs) what? (laughs) And he also creates a shadow Cujo. Yep. Isn't it crazy, though, that the sparrows... It's so, it's like double-sided. The sparrows are the thing that kind of uh, allowed his marriage to go the way it did. He Mm -hmm. credits that incident in the dark half, what he experienced to not noticing things he needed to notice with his wife. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of what saves him in the end because it's that 
um, otherness that is now a part of him that makes him able to use magic. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even, I love that. Gaunt in desperation leaps for the police and Alan one last time uses his wristwatch flower trick and yells abracadabra you lying fuck <laughs> that's the best line but in- ever but instead Abra- of flowers fuck you. <laughs> that's, like a fuck you that's from for our uh, adventure yes. zone yeah. friends instead of flowers it's the white the white pours through this I don't think I, I definitely had not started reading the gunslinger when the, I read this book at first so this read through Alan shouting it's the coming of the white. Fucking hit different, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alan punches him in the face with the light and he screams. He knows he can't kill it, but he's going to make it leave. He says, go hence, demon. You are cast out from this place. The awning bursts into flames. I love that. <laughs> and glass shatters out of all the windows. The valise bursts open. The souls are released. The poison that is going through people's veins is released, and the violence is released. Gaunt is screaming as he climbs into the talisman. Polly turns away, but Alan is doomed to see and forever remember this final sight. Talisman transforms as it pulls away into a black horse pulling a carriage and takes off into the sky. Caveat emptor is written on the side, which... Of course. Which means... The buyer. principle that the buyer alone is responsible for checking the quality and suitability of the goods before a purchase is made. In no other words, takes buyer b- <laughs> takes these vaccines. <laughs> um, it's weird yeah. that it transforms into this weird carriage and, and flies, flies away. But also, did I misread that Gaunt himself turns into a little... No, hunchback you man. He does. Yeah. yeah. Like a little weird hunchback goon. He's like an imp. Yeah. yeah. And, and flies off. And Alan's like, well. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen just as weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, the town kind of comes to rest and they leave to take Norris to the hospital. And Alan takes one last look back at the town as they're leaving at a town that is no longer their town. Oof. And then we're met with one small final chapter titled You've Been Here Before in Junction City, Iowa, a new town, new dramas, and a new store called Answered Prayers. <laughs> and that is Needful Things. <laughs> <laughs> this book is so good. It's so it's so good, you guys. It's it's madness. Can we just go around yeah. and say it's so good it's for so like good. a good it's ten so minutes? Good. <laughs> Let's, let's rate it. Yeah, let's get into our ratings. Uh, ben. I, I, I feel like I don't need to explain myself, <laughs> but I will. Okay, it, I'm really glad that we read this so soon after Tommy Knockers. Because I said, I believe, when we were rating Tommy Knockers, that it is when, when people that don't read Stephen King think of a Stephen King book, there's a certain type of book that they are imagining. And the Tommy Knockers was all of that, but bad. It is, <laughs> it is every everything a Stephen King, a archetypal Stephen King book is, and it sucks. Needful Things is what everybody thinks of when they think of a Stephen King book, but the polar opposite. It is every trope. It is every. Everything that he does best done so well. The the pacing is perfect. The characters are so great. I know we do five out of five, but ten out of ten. <laughs> uh, Blue chambray shirts. It's fucking amazing. Top top three King books. I think upon Easy. rereading this, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, this like I said, this is my my first King book. This is my favorite King book. I have been dying to cover this. So when Joel Jones selected this from Patreon, oh. I was Joel, so... Joel, you have done us a, a <laughs> kindness. <laughs> I, it was so amazing to read this again. Seeing uh, with the King knowledge I have now that I did not have before, it's made this book so much better than it was. It's such a beautiful way to tie up all that is Castle Rock. And it doesn't miss a beat. 
You think you're going to get overwhelmed by characters. You do not. No. There are things that you can let slide, but things that you notice on the second re- like second reading just make it so much better. So yeah, it is five out of five blue chambray shirts. See ya. Just like you guys said, this book is clever. It is beautifully written. It's just gorgeous top to bottom. I enjoyed it. It was my first read. I think I said that at the first episode. And it did something for me beyond just the story itself that I didn't expect because I read, I got into King as a teenager. And I feel like I found my favorite books as a teenager. The first one I read was Rose Matter. It's always been one of my favorites. And then shortly after that, I got into, you know, the Gunslinger and the Dark Tower series. And I have others that stick with me the same way that those do. And when we read Misery, that I had never read it before. And I was like, oh, this is another favorite. Mm -hmm. And now as we're reading this, it's kind of reinforcing that idea for me that I can still discover something new that I love about King that I thought I had like not exhausted, but I didn't know that I was going to have those beautiful teenage moments again where you are so sucked into the world. You want to know the characters you're rooting for them. I loved this top to bottom. Absolutely. Five out of five blue chambray shirts. That's it for this episode of dairy public radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us next episode where we are going to be watching the movie needful things for Joshua Khan and Benjamin Graham. I'm CM Alexander reminding you each according to his means Never mind each according to his needs, because they were all needful things. Hey everyone, Sam Alexander here. Thank you for listening to Needful Things Part 4. And a huge thank you to Joel Jones for his Patreon selection. As always, follow us on social media at Dairy Public Radio or send us an email with questions, comments, stories at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. And if you liked this episode, please show your support by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts so that other listeners can find us. If you don't use that platform and you still want to support us, you can follow us, check out our website, constantreaders.org, our Patreon page, sign up for a tier, make a one-time donation using our PayPal at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. And if you're like CM, why on earth would I give you guys my money? I get it. Instead, just tell your friends about us. Make them listen. Make them. Honestly, though, we're not part of a network. We don't have commercials. We are control freaks. Maybe just me. And your word of mouth is our network. We appreciate you. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.